here. I'm honored to be here. Um, and Amanda, if you could come in just for a second. I want to especially say that it is a uh, privilege for me to be here at Putney Moves. And for those of you who are not familiar with this wonderful place, uh, Amanda Upton is the founder and uh, owner and director of this place. And uh, I will make a um, shameless plug for the teachers who include my beloved wife, Kim Friedman, who is a certified Anasara teacher. And she is one of a number of superb teachers here. And I know that they're doing a, a, just a wonderful job here in the community. And so um, thank you, Amanda, for all that you're doing. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, as you uh, have already discovered, this is a free and open to the public. Uh, we are welcoming donations that will go to the upkeep of this lovely place and the fact that some people have to be paid in their, uh, in their endeavors. So any contributions you can make will go toward them. Uh, and that would be much appreciated. So, and I also want to uh, thank uh, Maria Dominguez, who was kindly offered to, she's one of the very competent uh, volunteers at uh, Broadway Community Television and has done wonderful work in the past, and I'm grateful that she's volunteered for tonight. So, Maria, thanks so much. So, to start, I'd like to do a few minutes of meditation. And, you know, much of what I'm going to um, explore in, a ser in these series of talks has to do with trying to imagine a new kind of politics. And it's a politics that is at heart a spiritual politics that calls upon all of us to pursue that part of our lives that it's easy for us to put aside, which is our interior lives. And basically the argument I will make over uh, these series of talks is that if in fact we are going to survive and thrive in the century ahead, and I'm talking a hundred years out, that without a very serious transformation from our sort of highly externally focused world to a much more internally focused world at the same time, I think that we're going to have great difficulty navigating the remarkable changes that are underway uh, at the moment and will continue at a breakneck speed, I imagine, as well. So uh, a little bit later, I'm going to, uh, we'll do a little bit of more formal zazen uh, sitting meditation. At this point, I'd just like to take a few minutes to settle ourselves and to, and so if I could uh, ask folks or suggest that we sit uh, with a straight back, however you might be comfortable, put your hands in whatever position. Ideally, you're, if you're sitting in a chair, your feet would be, uh, you know, solidly on the ground. Uh, and what we'll do is uh, keep your eyes open or closed, and let's just simply breathe, okay? Let's bring ourselves to this place, bring ourselves to this moment in time. Uh, we have busy lives. Um, and part of our uh, task, it seems to me, in the, in the decades to come is to learn to really, uh, learn to live in the present, to really be mindful of what's taking place both internally and externally. So if we can just sort of, you know, I love the expression that we drop into our bodies, that mind, heart, that we literally sink into the seat we're sitting in. And we'll do a very simple breathing, and if you could, Kindly follow me, I'll just, if you could be silent and again try to be as still as possible. And we'll just inhale, I'll do this out loud. Exhale, just count the number one at the end of the exhalation. Just breathe normally. Two, we'll count up to ten and then we'll go back to one. We're trying to let go of our discursive mind, that critical mind that many of us spend a lot of time developing. Four, breathe at your own pace. Six. 
seven. Observe it going in, follow it going out. Eight. Ten and back to one. One. Two. So let's just sort of pay attention to where our minds are, where our bodies are as we wrap this up. Thank each one of you for taking time from your busy lives to be here. Uh, I know you have jobs and families and dinner engagements and bedtimes to accommodate. So, And I want to thank you especially because these talks are part of an ongoing project of mine. And the project is to try to make sense of what a Buddhist politics might look like in the modern world with all the challenges that come from being political. And one might uh, have the impression that Buddhism historically was not very political. And I think the short answer to that is yes and no. And the fact is, is that um, in an electoral sense as we know it in the modern era, there hasn't been a lot of Buddhist parties, Buddhist movements. At the same time, if one looks at the life of the Buddha, the fact is, is that in his 40 years of teaching, he was political every day of the week. Because he needed to navigate going through lands with hundreds and allegedly thousands of followers, if there were that many. But there are many, many political decisions that had to be made, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. And I want to offer uh, a few caveats as I begin here. Uh, number one has to do with this notion of trying to articulate a Buddhist politics. And of course, there is no such thing as a Buddhist politics as in one politics, just like there's no such thing as a or a singular Christian politics. We have Christian churches that supported slavery, that supported apartheid, that supported segregation, supported all sorts of horrific human rights abuses. And we had other groups, the Quakers, who opposed every single war that this country has ever engaged in. They have their Christian politics. And so this in many ways is a Buddhist politics is really meaning one single person, i.e. myself, one Buddhist who happens to be thinking about politics. So I'm not being pretentious at all in thinking that this goes beyond my own idiosyncratic view of the world. And so I thank you for the opportunity for me to sort of begin to continue to flesh out my thoughts around this. The second thing I want to say is that when we talk about Buddhism as an ism, it is not surprising that we think about religion. And when we think about religion, of course, we have to think about institutions. 
and institutions are run and organized by human beings, needless to say, who are liable to make mistakes and to be greedy and to be self-indulgent and to be all sorts of things as we know too well. And Buddhist institutions throughout history have often done sponsored horrific things. You know, there's a very interesting literature around how the Buddhists in Japan supported the Japanese military during World War II. And if you look at what the Japanese military did in World War II, we can begin with Korea in 1910 and then continue right through, you know, the, the so-called rape of Nanking in China. It's one horrific, terrifying event after another with which the Buddhist community was often very complicit. And so when we talk about Buddhism, the institution, um, when I use the word Buddhism, I'm aware of the fact that we must explain exactly what we mean by it. Probably the more accurate term when we talk about Buddhism is what we call the Buddha Dharma. And that's known basically uh, the teachings of the Buddha. In the same way that it's curious that if you look at the teachings of Jesus about things like his attitude about poor people and rich people. And just out of my hat, if you look at the budget that was put forward in the last couple of days, what would Jesus say if we go by his words in the Bible? That would be a very interesting critique of this budget. In the same way that Buddhists can do the same critique about the teachings of the Buddha as we understand them. And I should say that in Buddhism, it was about 400 years before the Buddha's teachings were put to, I guess they were, I wasn't going to say paper, but papaya leaves, as it appears is where they, uh, what they were originally written on. Which is to say, over a 400 year period, needless to say, you know, these are countries obviously with oral traditions. These people have phenomenal memories. Have you ever been to a place where people, oral traditions, people, you know, they have, may have no education, but man, they can memorize like you can't believe. But as good as the Buddhist monks may have been in memorizing the teachings of the, of the Buddha, we have 400 years that passed. And so the notion of the Buddha Dharma is the, the, the teachings of the Buddha, and that's basically what I mean by Buddhism. Um, so those caveats are important um, to me anyways. Um, because I want you to, again, think very critically anything that I say here. I want you to say, uh, maybe yes, maybe no. So the four uh, presentations I'm going to make, some of you may have seen this little flyer here, is that the first one is today, uh, and the second one is in two weeks from now, and then it's the follow subsequent two Tuesdays after that. Okay, these dates are all spelled out. And just very quickly, what I'm uh, in the next session, and one of the things is that there's only so much obviously one can do in an hour or so. I'll hopefully talk not much more than an hour, hopefully within an hour today. Um, but the second, uh, I want to talk about this notion of opinions and uh, really get to the issue around political ideology. And the Buddha and many, many Buddhist teachers spend a lot of time on the, the both. Ideology is very important. It can be very helpful because it helps organize the world. It helps us figure out where to go. It also can be very, very dangerous. And in my sense of our politics today, we are living in a very, very ideological age. And that's fraught with, with dangers, in my opinion. The third one will have to do with, I'm going to lay out a, a specific model of what a Buddhist politics, this is the third presentation, what a Buddhist politics looks like. It's everything from foreign policy. What does a Buddhist foreign policy look like from my perspective? What does a domestic, for, a domestic policy look like? How do we deal with the issues of education? How do we deal with the issues of wealth and poverty? The criminal justice system is a huge piece of that. And Buddhists, have, Buddhists have a lot to say about that. And then finally, I'm going to try to present this model, and I use this uh, term, uh, bodhisattva army. And some of you may be familiar with the term, the bodhisattva is this person, is a sort of figure of great compassion, who one who literally serves 
uh, his or her life in the interest of alleviating suffering. And we'll get into that, uh, that archetypal figure. And what does it actually mean to, uh, to create, uh, if you will, an army of bodhisattvas? How do we translate this into practical politics? Politics is a very, very harsh, almost brutal, savage undertaking in most places. Buddhism presents itself very much as a way of peace, and a way of cooperation, a way of loving kindness. How do we reconcile those two pieces? And again, this is, these are opportunities for me to flesh out uh, some of my own thoughts around this and to hear from what you have to say. So anyways, in terms of tonight, I'm going to uh, talk what I hope will be about an hour, and then we'll have some questions and answers, and then we'll take a couple minutes for you to catch your breath. And then we'll come back and we'll do some very, uh, we'll do Zazen, uh, uh, Zen meditation. Um, and I should say that any time, don't hesitate. If you need to powder your nose, feel free, really. There's no, you know, uh, feel free to come and go as you need to. If you need to go home at a certain point, believe me, I understand. So, so tonight I want to talk about um, this vision of a Buddhist politics, what we can call a politics of compassion. We talk about meditation, we talk about the role of our sense of self and how meditation fits into that and how that can help us sort of transform how we think about others, especially our political opponents, as well as how we deal with some of our own emotions. That we are, you know, we're in difficult times uh, and the question is how do we negotiate that? Okay, just very, very briefly, uh, I know some of you here, um, I don't know most of you. Um, my short, short bio, autobiography for today is that I teach political science and history at Southern Vermont College over in Bennington, which I think is just a spectacular school. Uh, I taught at Marble College for seven years, was a dean for five years, which I think is also a spectacular school. And we have the great honor of having Kevin Quigley, the president of the college here, a former Buddhist. Uh, monk himself and uh, no doubt uh, someone who's bring, has brought a lot of sort of um, great energy and uh, creativity to what's going on up here in the, the, my, uh, uh, according to the rumor mill that I still sort of am a part of. So anyways, Kevin, I'm thrilled that you're here. Um, Anyway, so I've been teaching at the college level for uh, quite a while at this point. I've lived and traveled all over the world. I lived in Japan for a year and a half. I lived in Geneva, Switzerland for a couple of years in Central America, Mexico, Nicaragua. Did a fair amount of politics during that time uh, actively. Uh, and in terms of my own um, Buddhist background, I, when I was living in Japan, I started to go to this 14th century temple called Miyoshinji, which is a you know, it was built in something like 1350, and it's one of these places that has, you know, these giant meditation halls with these, it's all beautiful, dark wood and these, you know, these, these huge, huge trees that are probably 700 years old. They're like, you know, four stories high. And anyway, so I started to meditate uh, there on the weekends. They opened the, the monastery up to foreigners, gaijin, and uh, local Japanese folks. And uh, that's really where my uh, daily meditation began, which was back in January 1978. I was ordained uh, in, I think, about 2000 um, in the Zen Peacemaker Order. My particular tradition is Japanese Zen Buddhism. And for those of you who are familiar with that, there's two schools. There's Soto Zen and Rinzai Zen. They're a little bit different, but basically the same. And uh, my teachers actually come from both traditions, but it's more of a Soto Zen uh, school if, uh, if one were to uh, be more specific. So, and just in terms of my uh, approach here, I am not here to, uh, to convince anybody of anything. I'm here to offer a reflection. And um, I'm not attached to what you think of this, honestly. I'm a great proponent of AA's approach, you know, take what can be helpful, leave the rest, and if anything's helpful to folks, that would be lovely, and I'll be thrilled about that. 
The other, uh, another aspect of this is that I try to follow the, the Buddha's teachings around the notion of right speech, or healthy speech, or wholesome speech, or maybe loving and kind speech. It's part of the so-called Eightfold Path. And there are three guidelines. Number one, is, it, is what you say true? Number two, is it timely? Do you speak at a timely fashion? Do you say something that is factually true? And number three, is it appropriate, given the situation? And I trust that those things fit in here. I do my absolute best to avoid any ad hominem attacks against a person's personhood, whomever that may be, no matter how reprehensible I think their policies may actually be. At the same time, I feel we need to speak very clearly when our politicians are carrying out policies that lead to suffering, human suffering. We can talk about non-human animals, etc. And the absolute importance to stand up and speak clearly when our leaders are causing suffering in a very, very clear way. And that involves accountability, that folks need to be held accountable. And Buddhists and other folks around the world, religious leaders, etc., uh, people of faith, people of any tradition, it seems that that is a very important responsibility. <coughs> The Buddha taught many things, but the two dominant parts of his teaching was number one is that there is suffering, that there is struggle, there's frustration, there's hardship. There's also a lot of joy and wonders and happiness in the world, but we share that struggle on a day-to-day -day basis. And number two is that he provides a, a path, offers a path for us to try to alleviate some of that, to mitigate some of that suffering. And one of the things that I find most interesting about the Buddha's teaching, he says, do not, do not believe me and my teaching simply because I'm considered a holy man. He says, do not believe stuff because it's in a holy text. He says the most important thing in terms of whether or not you follow a path or not is your own experience. If your own experience speaks to you, and he used the word that's usually trans translated as wholesome, is this a wholesome thing? Is this good for people? Is this healthy? And so the question is, you know, how do we deal in a healthy way with the struggles we have in our life? And this is the path that the Buddha laid out, as we understand it. And again, I'll repeat it. I'll just say this a little differently. These are just my opinions, and uh, we'll leave it at that. All right, so I have no doubt that, I'm just curious, how many of you have some background in Buddhism? Just, you know, um, lovely. And so, you know, I, uh, some of this will be redundant and obvious to you. Um, in many ways, I always assume that we're starting at ground zero without belaboring the obvious, but also not to assume what may be obvious to people who have a certain amount of background here. So what I'd like to do is um, just very, very briefly cover just a couple of the points about, uh, you know, the, the so-called Buddha, um, and then we'll move on from there. But I think a couple of these are helpful in terms of framing a politics here, a politics of compassion, a politics of trying to minimize, to mitigate, if possible, to eliminate suffering. The Buddha was, as we, best we can tell, a man. Doesn't pretend to be a god, not divine. The dates are open to, to question. Some say he was born in 563, others say 480. This is before the Common Era. So call it 500 BCE, if you will. The story is he lived 80 years, that's usually agreed. The word Buddha is not the guy's name. It's actually a title of anyone who happens to have awakened, who has become enlightened. So the Buddha, in fact, could be a variety of people. 
This guy's name, as best we know, is Siddhartha Gautama. I usually pronounce it Gautama, but some of the people who know this better than I say Gautama. Um, and the story is, is that he grew up the son of a prince of some sort, some type of ruler. He was going to be educated to follow in his father's footsteps, and he went out, and the story goes, he saw a sick person, a dying person, and a dead person. And he had lived, supposedly, in the lap of luxury, and he was shocked. He said, oh my goodness, to his servant, you know, servant, Johnny, what's that? What's up with that? What's the matter with that guy? And Johnny, the servant, says, that dude's sick. That's terrible. The dying person, what's the matter with him? Dude, he's dying. Oh my goodness. Suppose he'd never seen this before. He's shocked. The dead person, oh my goodness. And the other thing is that, and then he saw this traveling ascetic and this holy man who sort of given up, um, you know, there were men, not women in those days, as I understand it, giving up the householder life. And he seemed very peaceful and very blissful. And he says, wow, oh, there's all this suffering in the world, and this guy seems chill. Right, just really sort of seemed pretty blissful. That's amazing. Make a long story short, there's this incredible urge. The young Siddhartha decides he's going to leave his young wife, his young child, and he goes off. And he's going to find in that question, the single question, as we understand it, that he asks is, why do people suffer? Why do people suffer? And that was the question that drove him for six years through this just incredibly uh, rigorous training, yoga, meditation, dietary control, very intense. The story is almost died, it was so intense. And then one day he said, okay, I think I'm there. You know, I'm gonna happen. The story goes, he sits down underneath the tree, and he says, I will not get up until I have awakened to what this life is about. <clears throat> the story goes, he said, the morning star comes up. He has a final sort of awakening through many, 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 many layers of consciousness or trances. He reaches down, says, the earth is my, uh, my witness that I am the Buddha, that I have awakened. And so the story is, after some hesitation, goes out and he talked for the next 40 years. And we'll talk a little bit about the politics, is that he was a radical. Number one, after some nudging by some of his relatives, he allowed women to join the community. He said, yes, women can be enlightened. Of course, he gave them more rules than the men. <coughs> Number two is that people had to give up their caste. You know, the caste system was developing still at that time in India, but people had to give up the caste. And if you were a Brahmin, you all of a sudden were equal to all the others. You know, and his definition was Brahmin is that if you have a noble heart, you are a Brahmin, which violated every sort of social norm that they had at this time. Anyways, we'll talk about some other things, but the point is, is that the Buddha created these new rules that absolutely put him at odds with uh, the norm, many of the norms of his day. The, what we know of as Buddhism today are the teachings are the, are the insights that supposedly he came to through that great awakening, that great enlightenment. Again, contrary to the dominant religions of the day, contrary to Christianity, in Buddhism there is no soul. There is nothing. They, they believe in rebirth, not reincarnation, but the idea is that there is a rebirth, but there's no essence, there's no thing that sort of passes on. It's more like the karmic energy. And I'll talk about that later. But, but, and there's no, there's no God. There's no soul and there's no God. And this is a radical departure. And when I talk about the self a little bit later, it gets tricky because this is interesting and really different from what many of us grew up with. So the Buddha's teaching is what he understood through this enlightenment experience. That's where this comes from, all of this. And again, I have to repeat, there's no divine intervention whatsoever. 
Okay, this is a human based series of revelation series of insights. Okay, so Buddhism obviously developed in Asia, it's come to the West in the last 100, 150 years. Uh, in terms of the school that I'm a part of, which is Japanese Zen, is known as the Meditation School of Buddhism. In India, in Sanskrit, it's known as Dhyana. Uh, in China, it's known as Chan. And in Japan, it's known as Zen, but it's known as the Meditation School. And that means that meditation is obviously a priority. In, in what we call Zazen, and this particular sect of Soto Zen with Dogen, one of the great religious uh, thinkers in history, uh, writes, he sees meditation as, as the heart of, of, of Buddhism. Now, one of the interesting things over the last 50 years has been this convergence of Eastern culture, history, civilization, and Western culture and civilization. And one of the things that's developed in Buddhism is this field of practice, a field of study called engaged Buddhism. And some of you are probably familiar with this. The Dalai Lama is described as an engaged Buddhist. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Vietnamese writer, activist, poet, is described as an engaged Buddhist. Aung San Suu Kyi of uh, Burma, Myanmar, you know, who's reputation has taken something of a hit in the last year or two since she's actually been in politics, an interesting study, and I don't pretend to know the inside story, although I read it from the outside, uh, but in her writing she speaks very, very powerfully about the role of Buddhism in politics. Engaged Buddhism is captured by the poet Gary Snyder, and this is his description of this evolution, this convergence in the last 50 years. He says, the mercy of the West has been social revolution. And when he says social revolution, he's talking about social justice. He's talking about human rights. The mercy of the West has been social revolution. The mercy of the East has been individual insight into the basic self, the basic void. And there he's talking about yoga and meditation. The mercy of the West has been social revolution. The mercy of the East has been individual insight into the basic self. And so this is very interesting. It's the politics surrounding social justice and also the insights from a deeply, deeply uh, contemplative practice. All right. So what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is to present something of a vision of what a Buddhist politics, an outline of a Buddhist politics look like. In the third presentation, I'm going to get into some real details about foreign policy and criminal justice, but I want to talk in a very general way here through this. And the metaphor I want to offer, and I don't know if this is a great metaphor, but this is sort of where my thinking is at the moment, is the idea that this is a politics of walking alongside of others. It's a politics of walking alongside of others. And what this means for me is that when we walk alongside of people, number one is that the weather could be raining, sunny, cold, hot. The sort of trials and tribulations of life are there. Number two is that when we walk, it's a long walk. One of the things about this politics is the fact that it's not necessarily about winning the next election. Aung San Suu Kyi's writing is very interesting. Even though she got elected recently, and for those who may not follow Burmese politics, Burma slash Myanmar has just an absolutely brutal, brutal military government for decades. And for a number of reasons, the military sort of slowly has moved away from that to a partial democracy in which they hold sway to a you know, significant amount, and some say dominant, but also there are popular elections. And Aung San Suu Kyi, who's this remarkable woman, 
uh, has become a democratically elected leader um, of the country. And she writes very eloquently about elections and the sort of long haul. So this notion of walking alongside others is that it's a long, slow walk. It's going to be a slog. It ain't going to happen today. But it doesn't mean that we don't walk with loving kindness and compassion in our hearts. So the politics of walking alongside others. So this is my vision as I am sort of outlining it. Number one, so to, to, to repeat the obvious, is this new politics is a Buddhist politics. It's a politics of compassion. Compassion meaning that we are able to, to identify, to see, to acknowledge the pain, the suffering of others, and then be compelled to move to alleviate it. So it's paying attention to the world and acting upon our compassion, our, our sense of togetherness with this people, the fact that we literally are walking together, we really are. And, and when you know, Buddhism talks about the fact that, especially in Zen, we talk about the fact that there is literally no separation between us and others. True compassion is really about your pain is actually my pain. And I think about you know, the mother and the infant hopefully the father and the infant, but that kind of connectedness where we push, where the ego is sort of set aside, where ourselves, our heart is so wide open, so raw, so, so connected to the folks in front of us that in fact uh, we're moved to act because we can't help it. It's as if it's happening to us. So the politics of compassion. So how do we get there? Number one, we need to slow down. The pace at which we live, and especially the electronics. You know, I teach college students, and those phones, don't try to take it away from them, seriously. When the students say, geez, I say, geez, you know, should, I, should we be taking away phones in class when you come to class? Oh, you, I mean, seriously, these students will get very serious. Don't even think about it. Like, are you kidding me? You're going to take it away from me? It's not to say one might not want to or shouldn't, but, but the point is, is that we are, we are, we are, it's hard for us to slow down, to be quiet, to be silent. These politics involve an internal journey. And if we look at the challenges where we are today, I mean, history has, go back 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, there were a million challenges and often with terrifying, terrifying challenges. The challenges coming today are coming at breakneck speed. Both the technology, the demographics in the world, 7 million, 9 million, maybe 12, maybe not that many. The technology, everything's connected. The disruptions are happening at a pace that has never, ever existed before. And what that means is that the old order is changing. And that order is causing disruption. And from a political point of view, what it means is that the people on the left and the people on the right are struggling. Everyone is struggling. In this country, folks on the right, they were not happy with Obama. They were not happy with this, what they seemed as sort of special treatment. And Hillary was not going to happen for them. That was for sure. It ain't anybody but Hillary almost. And of course, they're thrilled. You know, Trump's got 80% support among Republicans. I mean, his base is with him. And needless to say, we are in the great state of Vermont, and we are in the spectacular town of Putney, Vermont. And for folks on the left, needless to say, has resonance in this part of the world. The perception, I don't have to tell you, but the perception of Trump as 
just appallingly, just shockingly unfit, unqualified, unethical. Day after day, the shocks come one after the other. This is traumatic. This is truly traumatic for folks. And so the question is, how do we deal with that? From a perspective of this politics of compassion, is that we have got to move beyond what is out there. And the challenge is the fact that with these polarities, we have the demonization of the, our political opponents, the so-called othering of folks. You know, when Hillary in the election, obviously she made a mistake and suffered for it, but when she talked about the deplorables, calling half, half of the Trump folks deplorables, obviously backtracked almost immediately on that, but the point was made. If it's 50% or 20% or 10% or 5%, deplorable is a pretty stinging indictment. For Trump's part, it's probably two months ago, I can't remember, I was reading things, that he had sent by that point over 300 tweets where he insulted one person or an institution or another, 300 altogether. The demonization of the other has been alive and well. And so again, the question is how do we bridge that gap? And again, from this perspective, the idea is that we've got to begin by looking more deeply inside ourselves. And that we've got to identify those places in ourselves where the anger, the resentment, the frustration, the fear is residing. The Buddha famously said in one of the main texts of Dhammapada, this is translated a little bit differently in different places, but basically it says, hate cannot defeat hate. Only love or non-hate can defeat hate. That's not too unfamiliar to us, the notion of loving your enemy. And if you really took that, loving your enemy in a political realm, that's a tough one. But if that's not at the heart of Christianity, among the heart central pieces, politics is tough. So from a Buddhist politics perspective, it's clear that we need to look deeply at ourselves to tame our own aggressive instincts. And one of the things that strikes me as I think about this is that it is that rare politician on the left or the right who will ever ask their followers to be kind toward their opponents, to not demonize their opponents. It is rare for a politician to not basically pander to the selfish interest of their followers and not challenge the very selfishness of their followers. And to ask the fundamental question are you willing, as you pursue your own interest, to pursue other interests at the same time? I'm waiting for that politician to appear. From a Buddhist perspective, it seems to me that when we talk about our selfish interests, we're also talking about the selfish interest of others at exactly the same time. And in my vision of a Buddhist politics, when we talk about interest, self-interest, national interest, implicit in that are the interests of others. Because the fact is, is that we live our lives in many ways able to do that. Any of us who are parents or have siblings we love or people we not love, we think of ourselves and we think of our children at the same time. We just do. 
It's not that hard to do. We do it naturally. We think of ourselves and our children the same. Should we go here? Well, geez, well, what are the kids doing? It is not possible. It's not impossible. Marshall Rosenberg, uh, who does remarkable work in nonviolent communication, this is one of his central ideas, is that everything we do is in the service of our needs. Everything we do is in the service of our needs. And so the question is, when we look at behavior, are we able to look at both our needs and the needs of others? In looking at the behavior, we have to look behind what is motivating them. Let me make a few more points, and then we'll, uh, we'll open up for questions, and we'll go from there. So what I'd like to do at this point is to move to the question that is at the heart of Buddhism, is the notion of our self. Okay. <clears throat> I want to focus on, uh, on this issue of how we move to a, uh, a politics of compassion. And again, it involves having to take a look at who we are, to look at our interior lives. And so the way that this is organized in Buddhism and other places, social psychology, et cetera, is this notion of the self. You know, who are we really? What is this self? You know, this guy, Tom, who is that guy? Who am I, right, uh, sitting here? And I want to look at the self in the context of, of the three, what Buddhism talks about as the three characteristics of existence. And very quickly, the first is that things change, right? In permanence, everything changes, right? Some of us know as our hair color range, you know, by the day and sort of thinning, Lord knows, we don't, no one has to tell us things change. But actually everything changed. In a hundred years, this building may not be here. And I think that's, anyways. The second uh, characteristics of existence, or the, one of the great insights, is, the, is this notion of suffering. The fact that life is characterized by suffering, what is called dukkha, um, and that it's not that there's great joy, but it, we have to learn how to deal with it. And uh, you know, one of the things that I think about is the birthing process. And I have no doubt that uh, some of the women here have given birth to children. And it's just a remarkable thing. It's such a, in many ways, emblematic of what life is about, is that the absolutely unbearable, you know, I witnessed my two daughters uh, being born, the, the, the pain beyond pain that, uh, that is involved in childbirth is followed by maybe the greatest miraculous revelation of amazement. Here is my child. The pain and the joy in a matter of a minute, maybe the greatest pain and the greatest joy of one's life is right there in a single minute. And in many ways, it seems to me that embodies so much of what, we, what, what our life is about. And so the issue around suffering, uh, there are two pieces there. And I want to move beyond the birthing process, which is very, very particular. Um, to just the everyday uh, suffering. And this gets to this notion of self that we'll get into in just a second. And this notion is this. On a daily basis, there are going to be things that are going to be difficult. You know, two days ago, I got a paper cut. Just doing opening, and, I got, and it's bleeding all over the place, and it hurts like crazy. It's a paper cut. I didn't do, you know, I didn't do anything stupid. I was just, you know, I had a paper in my hand, and it's bleeding all over the place. And so the pain of the paper cut is life. There it is. But in Buddhism, we talk about the fact that pain is inevitable. But the question is, how much suffering is going to come with that pain? Is it, oh my God, I can't believe it. That was so stupid. God, am I stupid. Oh, that hurts so much. Wah. Right? I mean, how much of a fuss am I going to make about that paper cut? Because I could make a fuss. At the same time, I can say, okay, it's a paper cup, put a band-aid on and let's just move on, right? If you think about it, in many ways what Buddhism is, point is that life, pain is part of the deal. There's no way around it. Just look at birthing and death, right? Pain's part of the deal. The question is, how do we respond to it? And that is suffering. 
There are changes in the economy. There are changes in immigration. There are changes in the demographics of the country. The question is, how do we respond to those changes? And that's the task. And in many ways what Buddhism is arguing is that we need to develop the skills to do that. And in Zen and other places they talk about uh, skillful means. You know, how do you actually live your life? Well, you've got to learn particular skills. It's sometimes helpful to learn how to read and write so you can navigate. It, it's helpful to have an education so you can actually get a job that you may find more, more meaningful to, to, to given who you are. So we're trying to develop the skillful means in our lives to deal with the struggles, the pain, so that we, we minimize the suffering. And again, we've come back to the question of, you know, what is that about? And that comes back to the self, okay? And let me just take the quote that some of you know, and again, it's a great AA quote, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, <coughs> one of the great theologians, um, American theologian, you know, the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And in many ways, that's what Buddhism is trying to do in our particular practice. So we talked about um, impermanence, things change, we get that. That there is struggles in life, and how we deal with it, we get that. The third piece has to do with this notion of what's called no-self that there is no permanent self. And this gets a little bit tricky. And so let me try to explain it. And let me just say that I brought some books out there. And this is really incredible book by this guy, uh, uh, Andrew Olensky. Um, it's called Untangling Self. And he gets into this in a very, very profound way uh, about what the self is. And let me take what he says and summarize it. And it's this notion. It's the notion that this guy, Tom, sitting in the front here, is not really a permanent, solid, concrete, independent entity. That what I see moment to moment, this self is not a thing. It's not a noun. The self is a process. And the process is that I see things Buddhism, we talk about the form. It could be seeing, tasting, touching. That, that there is the physical reality, and basically there is the perception. How do I make sense of that? I can see it through my senses. How, does, how do I make sense of it here? And it's almost as if, instead of being a concrete statue, our lives are more like a film, where every second, and he says that if you go by the alpha brain waves, um, he says that in every second, he sort of estimates here, but he says in every second there are what he calls six mind moments. Beep, 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 in which our, our brain has sort of perceived, seen something, perceived it, and then translated that. And it's like a film. You don't have a single frame, is that you run a thousand of them in, in, in a row, that you think of something solid and it's ongoing and so forth, when in fact it's like one frame, another frame. It's just that it goes really fast. And his, what he suggests is that there may be six, he estimates, six mind frames in a given second. So that each of us in one second go beep, 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 beep. And therefore what we see of ourselves and the world is not something that's concrete. It goes back to the first idea of impermanence. It's also the idea is if you take an atomic microscope Man, that's real. You know, if I hit that, yow. But actually, what happens when we get an atomic microscope and we have a subatomic microscope and we look at this thing? There's nothing, there's energy. The neurons and all the rest of it. It's not neurons, I'm thinking of my neurons. Electrons and... You know what I'm talking about. But isn't it curious, though, if you think about it, it's not solid. That ain't solid. There's energy going a million miles an hour at the very heart of that. And let me read a couple things here. And this is from, because this says it much better than I'm saying it. This one book by this guy, uh, Bruce Hood, he's a cognitive neuroscience. He says, and I quote here, 
You only exist as a pattern made up of all the other things in your life that shape you. He says, he continues, this does not mean that you do not exist at all, but rather that you exist as a combination of all the others who complete your sense of self. Olensky describes this. He says that the recent discoveries in neuroscience and experimental psychology, he says, have produced what he calls a systematic deconstruction of the idea of the self as an essential entity. He says that the self, our notion of our self, Tom, with all of my sort of characteristics and my identity, he argues is a view. V-I-E-W. It's a view. He argues it's a product of our perceptions and our senses. And he says that, that we have our consciousness interprets experience this this micro moment one after the other and it unfolds continually. And so he argues that the self is a process. It is not a thing to hang on to. The question is, who is it that has the opinion? He says it's, the, it's not the, what we have an opinion it's that we have an opinion. And he takes this a step further. And he says, because we tend to view things as something solid, he argues we tend to put people in boxes. Think about it. You know, I was just with someone yesterday, they're moving into a house and the people next to them had this big sign, they were pro-Trump. And this person said, oh my God, they have a pro-Trump sign. The point is, they put that person in a box without ever having seen them, met them, know anything about them because of the signs out there, because of this thing that, this idea that, or this idea of Trump or pro-Trump being a particular box. And he goes on, unless he goes on and talks about the fact that because we do this, we put literally much of our lives in these boxes and it closes us off to living openly and ultimately compassionately. We create our own prisons with our, with our strong opinions. And so let me wrap up with, uh, I'll wrap up here. The response to that, he argues, is what is, we call equanimity, equanimity. And he argues that every moment of mindfulness, and we'll get into this in a little bit more after the break, every moment of, moment of mindfulness, meaning be paying attention, being 100% present, not judging, not critiquing, not being in, there's one uh, teacher talks about, to be in the center of one's awareness, to be in the center of that awareness, to be fully, fully, engaged in that provides equanimity. He argues that when, we are, that when we are able to be mindful, paying attention moment to moment, we are not attached to wanting things to be differently. The idea is to live our life with awareness without wanting. Not wanting to be like this, not wanting to be like that. He talks about equanimity as an emotion, as something between liking and disliking. And he says, this is when we're fully alive. That when we are in this moment, we are not trying to make it another moment. We are present for that moment, even if it's difficult. And he goes the final, and just a couple more things. He uses the example of loving kindness. And he says that loving kindness exists when we care deeply about someone without the complications of liking or wanting them. This is what we would call selfless love. The issue is not love itself because love can be intense 
and passionate, but it, when that love becomes self-referential, when it becomes about ourselves, when the love in fact becomes selfish. And he says we can do that, but it leads to more and more suffering. So the idea here is to love with equanimity, to be free of being, making it into something about ourselves, to really be free of that attachment. And I love this idea of selfless love. So let me finally read a, a summary of this by Bell Hooks. Many of you know she's a writer, African American woman, she's a Buddhist. This is her, this is how she looks at this. She says, dualistic thinking, <clears throat> which is at the core of dominant, dominator thinking. Again, dualistic thinking, which is at the core of dominator thinking, teaches people that there is always the oppressed and the oppressor, a victim and a victimizer. Hence, there is always someone to blame. Moving past the ideology of blame to a politics of accountability is a difficult move to make in a society where almost all political organizing, whether conservative or radical, has been structured around binary, around the binary of good guys and bad guys. Accountability is a much more complex issue. Accountability is a more expansive concept because it opens a field, the possibility wherein we are all compelled to move beyond blame to see where our responsibilities lies. Any effort I make to challenge his domination is likely to fail if I am not looking, looking accurately and laying at the circumstances that create those sufferings and thus see a much larger picture. So again, I think in summary, is that what we're looking at there is that we're looking for a politics of compassion where one can be very clear about trying to eliminate suffering and at the same time is not seeing others in effect as our enemies. So let me stop there and you have been terribly patient. Um, let's open the floor, comments, um, questions, anything, and then we'll take a little break for those of you who can survive a little bit after that and we'll do a little more meditation. So the floor is open. Yeah, please. Yeah. I have a question that would yeah. be really helpful uh, to step back and start with the word politics. Yeah. Great. I mean, you know, the traditional, the traditional uh, definition of politics is about power, right? One of the great uh, political scientists out of Harvard, his, his definition of politics was who gets what, when, and how. In other words, who gets the resources of society? So education, healthcare, good paying jobs, all, housing, all that stuff, the resources. Who gets, who, gets, who gets what, when, how quickly do you get it? You know, do you get healthcare right away because you have a niche healthcare provider or do you wait in the city at emergency room for it when the doctor shows up? And how do you get it? Is it free, do you pay money, or do you not have any health insurance? So politics fundamentally is that process by which decisions are made in society to distribute the resources in that society. And so again, you know, the federal budget, the, the political process by which money is gonna go to, uh, you know, school lunch programs or to the military, uh, that process is what politics is about. You know, another is politics, you know, another simple way, it's about power. Who's, and if we think, you know, what is power? Power is the ability to make something happen. Legal or not, you make it happen, you have the power. Does that help? That's a great question, thank you. Do you want comments as well as questions? No, please. Uh, everything's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not. I'm not a Buddhist as such, but there are several skeins of Buddhism that uh -huh. have informed my own practice yeah. um, over the years. 
one of them is the idea of outcomelessness, which you, you, you verbalized a little yeah. differently. Yep. Than yeah, yeah, yeah. Outcomelessness. Right. <laughs> yeah, that, right. that you know, you do what you do without certainty of the outcome. Absolutely, right. And um, also the idea of uncertainty. Yeah. Um, which you, you know, articulated as impermanence. Yep. Um, but the worldly conditions are ever uncertain. And so where I have landed in my own idiosyncratic, semi-Buddhist, semi-Advaita way, um, is I have been thinking about the partisans in World War II, of Italy and France. Mm -hmm. And they did what they did, and they didn't get to see how it came out. Yes. Um, many of them lost their lives without knowing that Hitler was defeated. And so for me, um, what has been helpful and in a funny way freeing since what on one level we could call this disaster of an election to me, um, is this idea that now, and I don't know if you would call this a politics of Buddhism, but now we get to decide to do what we do out of our own moral standing and sense of what is right, right. not because we have any guarantee whatsoever right. of how it will come out. Right. We are the partisans. We're right. hiding in the woods right. without knowing how it comes out. And so in that sense, in a very funny way, it's kind of liberating because it means there's less time devoted to thinking about strategy and evaluating, does it work, does it not work? Right. Because simply one is directed by one's moral compass right. and one does what's right regardless of the outcome right. as those partisans right. did. Yeah. So there, it's, it's not exactly... It's a beautiful but example. That's sort of how I... And, and that sort of frees me. Right. You know, a young, a young person was sitting next to me on a plane and got into conversation with me and recognized sort of an elder social justice activist for, and said, so what do we do? Right, right. <laughs> and I, I said this as I said again. I mean, we don't know what to do. Right. But that, in a way, is in a funny way a great gift. Yeah. And I think that's one of the difficulties of a Buddhist politics like this. Uh, first of all, I think what you articulated was beautifully put and a superb example. Um, let me try to answer and respond to this in a few different ways. The Zen pacemaker order, which I'm a part, has three tenets. One is, bear, is not knowing, like we don't pretend to know. Number two, but we bear witness to the suffering of the world. Number three, loving action. And explicit, it's not even implicit, explicit is the fact that we don't know how it's going to turn out. But there is a moral imperative, exactly what you're saying. There is a moral imperative. This is the right thing to do, therefore we didn't do it. We don't know actually what the result's going to be. You know, as a political strategist, it's all about winning. And from a very pragmatic point of view, why the heck would you do anything that's not going to have a very clear result. This is we're going to, we need to win this election. We need to do whatever. You know, it makes no sense from a business point. I mean, from an organizational point of view, in many ways, it's, it's antithetical to a result-based strategy. Um, and I think that you know, and again, Aung San Suu Kyi in her writing says. What she argues is the fact that, um, you know, the question is, you know, revolution. You know, one of my field of study before I got into this was American foreign policy in, in the so-called third world, and in particular in response to revolution since 1945. And of course, revolution by definition, most of 99 out of 100 definitions, has got to be a violent, you know, it's violent. That's the nature of the beast. And, um, and so she argues that if you carry out violence in Burma 
you will perpetuate violence on an ongoing basis. If you win by violence, you will create a violent society. One can argue historically, maybe yes, maybe no. I mean, she's probably right, but we can maybe find some exceptions. But from a, so from a strategic point of view, you want, you know, it's almost by any means necessary to get to where you want to get to. And my sense of a Buddhist politics is that traditional approach to politics is not how to go. It is exactly what you said, is that you do it because it's the right thing to do without knowing the result. And again, from the peacemaker order, that's the not knowing piece. And Bernie Glassman, who's my teacher for many years and sort of run the thing, or, you know, I mean, he, he lives by that, you know, not knowing we're going to do this and we have no idea what's going to happen. That's not persuasive to a lot of people who live in the so-called real world. It's a great example, though. And I think that's one of the dilemmas. Is there a balance between the two? How do you do both? So thanks. That's lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Solomon. Yeah, yeah. Solomon. Is there no, you're right. Listen. Question, the first is just articulate what I'm hearing to make sure that uh, groundwork kind of. Yeah. So I'm hearing that ethical engagement politically and in the world comes on the basis of a reorientation of identity, expansion and broadening of our identity. So why don't you start again? The whole issue of identity, is that what you're saying? Yes. I'm hearing that ethical action comes okay, yeah. on the basis of a deconstruction of the self, okay. the expansion of our moral concern. Uh huh. And that leads to nonviolence. And I guess I'm wondering in cultivation of that? Yeah. What a Buddhist politics has to offer as that sense of our porousness and interconnection with the other that we may be other. Yeah. And in lieu of that, what are the sort of ethical norms or standards or relative codes to follow until, say, we realize that, you know, the the food that we're eating is related to the suffering of my right. workers or right. that the car that we're driving yeah. is possible. So like before our identity expands to that. Right. So is, is, your, is your question around what are the ethics that would underlie this politics? I'm just curious like how you would respond. Yeah. You know, one of the things I didn't talk about is that in Buddhism, ethics almost come before everything else in terms of even meditation. And there are basically five ethical standards that, that are universal. I think universal is, from my reading. You know, you don't kill. And you know, vegetarianism, people go different, debate that, right? Some people need meat, you know, the Buddha ate meat, you know. Anyways, but you don't kill, you don't steal, you don't lie, you don't use intoxicants, you know, to blurry the mind, and you don't use uh, sex in a uh, hurtful fashion, okay? Um, and, and meditation, if one is violating any of these ethical standards, guides, if you will. And this is, you know, it's, this is not about sin. It's about wholesomeness, unwholesomeness. It's going to make you unhappy. This will make you happy. By following these, one's individual meditation and everything else is going to be much, much stronger, right? So any sort of transgression around these ethical are really going to affect the ability to be with other people in a compassionate way. 
It's not to say that it's not impossible, and none of us are perfect, so obviously we all have certain transgressions there. Um, I'm not sure I'm getting, I, I don't know if that's helpful. So, that, I mean, the ethical piece is absolutely foundational to everything I've talked about. And, um, you know, any serious Buddhist practice involves people, what we call, taking the precepts. You know, and these are guides to one's life. Basically, these are the five precepts. And again, we don't talk about this commandments, they're not sins. These are things that lead to happiness. Uh, but ethics are actually foundational almost before anything else. So I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> so it's about, uh, it's about quarter out. So let me, um, how many folks have done like formal meditation before? Just a, a sense of this. Yeah. Formal. Yeah. Um, in other words, sort of with instructions and so forth. I mean, some people pick up a book and sit and it's great, I'm just curious. So this is, this is particular, okay? Um, and so it may be different than what some of you have had before, uh, even within, you know, the school of sort of Japanese Zen Buddhism. People teach it a little bit differently. Um, I've been in enough centers and monasteries to, you know, sort of experience, but it's not that different. So what I'm going to give you is, sort of, I guess, pretty standard. So. Um, and so, <clears throat> let me just talk top to bottom. So there are different positions. Um, number one is, you know, all positions are fine. It's not that one is better than the other, okay? And I can't get up, but let me just, so Solomon almost has the, you know, the full lotus you're probably familiar with, the half lotus, he's in one leg up. I sit Burmese, one is sort of tucked right in front. Uh, John is sitting, you know, sort of in a chair. And then some people, you know, they don't have the bench, but some people would put uh, something on the bottom and put their legs behind them. And see so. Um, so I get, I think, you know, where you are is fine. But the, the most important thing is the back. Okay, so the back is straight. And the head is going to be, if you look straight ahead, your head is tilted down just a little bit, okay? Um, in terms of the mouth, I'll just wait one second. So again, we have a straight back. The head, if we look forward, the, the head is just tilted down a little bit. Now, you can open your eyes, close your eyes. Most teachers make the argument that if your eyes are open, your mind's not going to wander as much, okay? And so what we're going to do is that we're going to glance down about two or three feet in front of you, okay? And, um, and the idea is to soften the eyes. And, you know, sometimes your eyes play tricks, but basically, you're looking down without sort of staring too hard, okay? Uh, all right, in terms of the mouth, in terms of formal zazen, uh, again, which we call sitting meditation, is that the mouth is closed, the, the teeth are closed, not partially, but closed, and your, mouth, and your tongue is sort of pressed against the roof of your mouth and touching the back of your upper teeth. So the idea is that you close your mouth so that you're not salivating a lot. Okay. Now the hand position, again, you can do it as you will, but the, the, the traditional position, if you can all look here, and I know some of you know this, but this is what's called a cosmic mudra. Okay? And the idea is that your, these middle fingers will be sort of on top of one another, and again, again, different teachers have different things, but most of different uh, guidelines would have the left hand on top of the right hand, okay? And part of the logic here is that the right side of our brain is more creative than the left side, therefore, uh, therefore, in, you know, it sort of goes in the opposite direction, so therefore we put the left hand uh, sort of in the right hand to sort of keep it in, in check a little bit more. Uh, and the other part is to very, very lightly touch your thumb tips together. 
And basically what that means, if you look straight, and again, where you want to put your hands is sort of against your pelvic. And again, different teachers teach different. Some have them literally sort of up here like this. Um, but you know, but I, I find, and, and I think most teachers would say that in your lap like this, in your lap against your pelvic, uh, so that it just sits really, really naturally there. You're not holding it up, but it sort of rests on your upper thighs there. And so again, you have your left hand on top of your right hand and your thumbs are touching very, very lightly. And what that means, if you look straight down, you know, look straight down, your thumbs will be covering your middle finger. Okay, your middle fingers, I guess your middle finger. Um, and so the idea is that, the, the, and, and we'll get to the breath in a second, but there are two or three things that we're really paying attention to all the time. Number one, that the back is straight. Number two is that your, your thumb tips are touching gently. And when we begin to, our mind wanders or we begin to fall, or, fall asleep, often your thumbs will just start to wander all over the place. It's a telltale sign. When I'm falling asleep, it's like, you know, it's like, oh, my thumbs are going like this. Okay, when I'm really focused, uh, I'm able to really pay attention and have my thumbs be nice, gently touching one another. All right, so we have the straight back, our eyes are down. Keep them open if you feel comfortable. If you're more comfortable closing them, close them. And again, your, your, uh, your left hand on top of your right, your thumbs are very gently touching. We're holding that as still as possible. And the breathing is ideally what we want to do is that we want to do a sort of stomach breathing or yoga breathing, depending on how you've done it. So that when we inhale, our stomach goes out. Exhale our stomach goes in. Inhale, out, and in. Now, in Zen meditation, there's an emphasis on what we call the hara, the hara, the, the stomach, the, the sort of, seen as the sort of the spiritual center of the body. It's just a couple inches below the belly button, okay? And so the idea is that straight back, our hands are in our lap, and we're just breathing naturally. We breathe in through our nose silently, tummy out, and then exhale, tummy in. And as we're doing the exhale, we're counting the number one. Inhale, naturally, exhale, two. I'll go over all this again, but just to be quick. Inhale, exhale, three, etc. And again, we go up to 10, if you can get to 10, and then we go back to one, okay? And the idea is that we're trying to bring all of our energy to our posture and to the breath. And that we really are paying attention to both at exactly the same time. And so let's just give this a go. So back is straight, Head is tilted down a little bit. We're closing our mouth. Not too hard, but gently, but trying to eliminate space. Just breathe in naturally, stomach out. Stomach in, exhale, one. So let's go to 10 and then we'll see if folks have questions just about the posture.
Okay, so let's stop for just a second. The other thing that's important in this is that very quickly thoughts will come in. Feelings will come in. Oh, I have to call my mother. Oh, I forgot to do this. Oh, I really don't want to do this. Oh, my back is killing me. Oh, this is really a pain. The idea is not to suppress the thoughts. Let the thoughts come. Simply say, okay, that's a thought. That's an emotion. That's a feeling. Let me just let it slide and come back to the breath. Okay? So we're recognized thoughts. And again, sometimes I have nothing but thoughts the entire time I'm meditating. That they come, they go, they come, they go. If we're worrying about stuff, it's very difficult. But the idea is that we're always coming back to the breath. And this goes to like our life in terms of out there. You know, when we talk about compassion and all this other stuff, the idea is that we don't just react. Someone insults us, we react like this. No. What it means, someone insults us, paying attention to the moment, to that very, very moment. We say, okay, let me watch myself. I can pay attention to my reaction, I, reaction, and we can respond. So with the meditation, what we're doing is that we're paying attention to where our mind is. What are the thoughts that are coming in? And then we're basically saying, okay, that's thought. I'm really, really worried about this. Let me put it aside. I'm going back to my breath. And you may spend the whole time because it's really a big issue. It's really bothering you. That's okay. The idea is that we're always coming back to our breath. We're recognizing that this is a thought, this is a feeling. Okay? There's no such thing as bad meditation. If you're meditating, it's good meditation. All right? Don't critique yourself. My, my concentration is terrible today. That's fine. It's like when you jog. If you jog for 20 minutes, some days you run like a deer, other days you run like a slug. And guess what? It's all good because you're exercising. Okay? So anyways, questions just about the, about the posture itself. And we'll, we'll, we'll do sitting for a little bit here. I want to recognize that those of you who don't have a pillow to sit on, your back may get pretty sore. And so it's really important to recognize that for most people who have meditated a lot, to really elevate your, your bottom, simply because it just before long your, strat, your back is really stressed. So um, if you don't have a pillow today and your back is sore, you know, when you do this, I want to encourage you to sort of elevate because it's just, it's that much easier on your back. So, so any questions about the posture? Okay. So um, it's moving toward, it's about five of nine, four of nine, five minutes. What, what can you all, what do you want to do here? 10 minutes, 10 minutes may be too much. Five, seven. five minutes, five minutes it is, okay? So I'll just talk a little bit uh, and then I'll be. Uh, so traditionally we have three rings to uh, start the meditation period. And basically the idea is that by the third ring, you should be completely still, okay? And the first couple, sort of, <laughs> you have a little of a time to sort of get settled. Straight back, eyes down, thumbs touching. Bring all our attention to our posture and our breath.
wanders, just go back to the number one. Just start again. attention to this next breath. Watch the air come and go. So as we wrap up this five minutes here, just pay attention to how you feel, how your mind is, how your attention is. you're unfolding here, just a thought in terms of those who are interested in starting or continuing or strengthening a meditative practice. Most teachers uh, agree that the best time to meditate is at the beginning of the day, before you get into the busyness of your life. And for me that is you know, a shower, shave, a cup of coffee, and then sitting on the pillow, usually before my wife and children wake up. Um, the idea of, and it's one of the, I think, really clear guidelines is that it's better to meditate every day for five minutes than to meditate once a week for an hour. Because what happens is that there literally is a shift of consciousness when we sit quietly, even for five minutes, on a daily basis. Because what happens is that you develop this little reservoir of patience, a little reservoir of, resist, of resilience, so that when things happen, things roll off a little bit more easily. The frustration does not come as quickly. Um, again, for those of you who are trying to get into a meditative practice, be gentle with yourself. It's not a race. It's the dailiness. Start with five, you can go to 10, that's lovely. I found historically that 20 minutes is, is, it's almost like jogging. You know, 20 minutes is a pretty good run. You're sweating, you're really in uh, the groove a bit. 20 minutes will give you a solid 
quantity of time. And in places it can move to 30, 40, and uh, more than that. So uh, if you're just not a morning person, find the time. You don't want to meditate on it on a full stomach simply because your blood is going to your stomach and not your head. Um, meditating in the group is a great way to be accountable. You know, when we sit with other people, you know, we don't scratch as much and we don't, <coughs> it's just, there's an accountability that's very helpful. Um, the idea is if you can find a place that's quiet, same time, ideally, at least the same place, establish a little place that's quiet. It could be in, literally, it could be in the corner of a room. Uh, if you're really in a small space, you know, in the Soto uh, monasteries, we meditate facing the wall. You're literally like that. I mean, I don't. I don't. I prefer facing the middle, but face the wall, so you don't need a big room. Uh, so, anyways, any questions, comments about that? Any of this? I have a question. Yeah, please. About, uh, about the uh, Alinsky's uh, thing about. I think you said there's at any in any moment there's six different mind states. Right. Um, what he was saying is the fact that, you know, there's a cognitive perception that takes place, you know, very, very quickly. And the, did you have a question that followed that? Or you, you yeah, know? I wasn't certain if they were, is it, are they, are they uh, correlated with sensations? No. Yes, exactly. It's basically the idea is that I, I think he uses the term mind moments. And, and the idea is that, you know, as we're sitting here, you and I are looking at each other. The idea is that within one second, our mind has gone beep, 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 beep six times. In which my visual sense sees you and then my perception you know, my response and the perception makes sense of that, which is that I see you, you know, sitting there in the th second row and all the rest of that. Um, and so the idea is that our lives are this whole, s uh, this, it's, it's constant flow of those moments. And that we perceive things as solid that in fact we can break down to these many sort of sensations and perceptions. You know, there's a sensation, we perceive it. It's like instantaneous. So it's like we're talking beep, 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 even though that was all one second. And so over the last two minutes, we see this as something concrete and solid and like not changing. But the point is, is that every, every little mini second we're, you know, we're perceiving something different and that it's changing all the time. Um, and I think a lot of this comes down to the fact that you know, when we have opinions and we have ideas about things, we cling to those so intensely. And the idea is that if we're clinging to something that's changing every single, you know, mini second, we're holding on to something that in fact isn't there at all. And so, uh, you know, what Olenskis and others are talking about is the fact from a, uh, you know, from a physical point of view and from a mental psychological point of view, we're literally trying to hold on to something that is not there. And therefore, we should, less, we should lessen our grip. It's not that we don't have opinions, but let's lessen our grip. Let's lessen our grip on our attitudes, our ideas, our concepts, and all of that. It's not as though we don't have them. We just have to sort of let go a little bit. Does that make sense? Did that get to the question you were trying to get at? Yeah. I relate that to Shoot. mindfulness. I'm sorry? I relate that concept to mindfulness, that idea of being mindful in every single moment of your exactly. day. And right, right. So if, that, if you're trying to do that, then you're being mindful of every little lip. Exactly, exactly. Every thought, in fact, we're paying attention. And the idea that we respond, we don't react. You know, and the idea that, you know, you grow up in a family, someone insults you, and you throw a punch. 
right? I mean, there are those children who grow up that way. And there they are, 18 years old, someone insults them, they throw a punch. They, don't, they didn't even know that they did it almost. And that's sort of mindlessly. And, you know, one of the things about the meditation is the fact that if we're, in order for us to be mindful throughout the day in all of our tasks, we've got to develop our muscles. And we develop our muscles, our mind muscles, when we sit quietly. And this is the thing about being still, is that we are really clear this is about the mind that's at work. And that's why the posture is important. That's why being still is important. Is that, you know, next time we're going to do walking meditation, but in, even in walking meditation, we're busy doing all this, and it's just hard for us to sort of see how our mind is functioning, you know, so acutely. And so again, the idea is that by sitting quietly and really paying attention where our mind is going, how it functions, what is it that we're thinking about, we begin to understand why we behave the way we do in our lives. And the fact that, in fact, we can change this. The fact that we can learn, we can train the mind to actually live differently. And that mindfulness, and again, and part of it has to do with hanging on to our concepts and our opinions, and therefore learning how to let go of that is, you know, using some of this neuroscience saying, you know, actually the science is proving this these days. Um, and I thank you for the point, is that it was implicit, but the mindfulness piece, you know, in terms of the Buddhist path, the so-called seventh and eighth uh, sort of parts of that, that they're, that they usually put them seven and eight, is that there's mindfulness and there's meditation. And these two things are absolutely inextricably bound simply because we need to develop those mind muscles. And we have to practice. And that's one reason why the daily practice is so important in terms of, you know, just steady. You stay, even if a little bit of exercise, we're exercising that uh, you know, that responsive mind, not that reactionary mind. That was great. Any final thoughts? So you all have been lovely. Thank you. I feel honored to be here tonight. And uh, it's a real pleasure. Happy to chat. Um, and I will tell you that um, if folks are part of organizations or groups or anything that you would like me to help out in any way, if it's simply leading a little meditation or giving a talk or anything, I'm always available. This is part of you know, what I do. I'm, I'm free. Uh, I'm a cheap date, I promise. <laughs> and my only requirement is that um, if there's a place nearby that has hot foot Sundays, then <laughs> Uh, we will invite him back, but otherwise, uh, I'll do it for you know, without any expenses. So, thanks so much, you've been lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.